Let's uh, get started. Um, we're very excited to have Megan Hunter uh, tell us about uh, her work. Uh, as usual, the rules are that um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom. Uh, if you're a panelist, feel free to just interrupt whenever you feel like it. And uh, at the end, we'll stick around a little bit to discuss the paper. Uh, so uh, stick around if, if you'd like. Uh, all right. Uh, Megan, why don't you get started? All right, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me and thanks for organizing this seminar series. And thank you all for, for being here. Um, so this is very much still a work in progress. I'm in the middle of some major revisions right now. So it's a really great time to get feedback. And I appreciate any comments or, or feedback you have. Um, I have some built-in pause slides, but you know the panelists can also interrupt me at, at other times. So this work is called Chasing Stars, Firm Strategic Response to Online Consumer Ratings. Did my slide advance? Yep. So in general, we know that consumers pay a lot of attention to ratings. There's extensive research in marketing and economics showing that ratings matter. And in fact, up to 90% of consumers read online reviews before making a purchase. It's been shown that negative reviews are particularly salient. And Cabral and Hrotescu found that a single negative review can cost a business 13% of weekly sales. But what hasn't been studied quite as much in the literature is how firms pay attention to their ratings. And so what I'm going to be doing in this work is looking at how firms try to proactively change their ratings in a service-based setting. So my research questions are, do firms respond to online ratings? And do they take on short-run strategic activities to influence their ratings? And how do these actions vary, vary quality perceptions or change the distribution of quality available? And second, how do the way that ratings are displayed vary incentives for firms and change consumer welfare? So why do we care about these questions? So I'm gonna be measuring sort of how firms are gaming their ratings. And I think there's a lot of broader implications of this. So first there could be misaligned incentives between consumers and firms. So what I mean by this is it's likely that consumers are trying to find the highest quality firm they can, and firms are just trying to appear to be the highest quality they can. There could also be a misallocation of effort in that firms are trying to improve their ratings rather than improve other aspects of their business or their actual inherent quality. And ratings might also serve to homogenize firms. So perhaps we start seeing firms as being like this four star bucket, four and a half star bucket, and we ignore other aspects that differentiate them. So a quick preview of my results is I find that firms do in fact respond to their ratings, which makes sense since we know that consumer demand is impacted by ratings and that firms incentives can be quite strong. So for example, when a firm only has five reviews and they're on the cusp of a ratings rounding threshold, which I'll explain what I mean by that shortly, they can increase their firm value by up to 25% by engaging in certain strategic activities. And then using a structural model and looking at counterfactuals of how ratings might be displayed differently, I find that rounding ratings might be lowering consumer welfare. So now that hopefully I've motivated the ideas behind this talk, I'm gonna give a quick literature review. Then I'll describe my particular setting and my data context. Then I'll show you some descriptive evidence how, on how firms are responding to their reviews. Then I'll outline my model of firm behavior and present some results and counterfactuals. So, you know, we know there's extensive literature on um, how consumers respond to review. Uh, Dina Maislin's here and she has one of the first papers looking at the causal effect of how ratings impacts demand. And there's a more recent literature on how firms respond to reviews. So some of the early work on firm response was theoretical, looking at how prices might change in response to reviews. And more recently, there's been empirical work. So for example, how um, firms might actually respond directly to reviews, for example, writing responses um, to comments on TripAdvisor, as well as looking at advertising and service and how advertising and service might be complements or substitutes to someone's reviews, as well as pricing. So this prior work has looked at how firms respond to ratings, but I'm gonna be looking more at how firms are proactively trying to change their ratings. So what is my particular uh, data setting? So I'm looking at the auto repair market. So it's quite a large market, it's $67 billion in the US. So it's just you know, an interesting market in itself to study. And it's also a high ticket item. So consumers spend almost $1,000 a year on auto repair. So it's likely gonna be the type of purchase that a consumer wants to do some research in and maybe look at reviews before they make this purchase. The market also has lots of information asymmetry. So what I mean by that is that consumer, the general consumer doesn't know that much about auto repair. So they're likely going to have to rely on the mechanic to sort of understand what's going on and um, do a good job and tell them the truth about what's wrong with their car. 
Finally, it's a fragmented and competitive market. So 75% of auto repair shops are independent mom and pop shops instead of dealerships and chains. And in my data, I actually exclusively have independent shops. And prior literature has shown that reviews matter more in these contexts than when there's big brand names. So I think it's a good, uh, good setting to study these questions. So my main data provider is a third party platform that has a website with auto repair shops and any auto repair shop on their site, they have invoice data um, for invoices going back two years before they join the site, as well as um, going on after they join the site. This platform also has uh, reviews for these auto repair shops, which they solicit from verified customers. And they're given a survey, these customers are given a survey where the last question is, how would you rate this auto repair shop generally? And that number is used to post on the website. So from this provider, I have invoice data from the auto repair shops. I have those surveys or ratings solicited by the platform. And then I supplement with Yelp ratings because Yelp is just much more widely used uh, by the general consumer. So through this data, I have about 1300 shops across 800 cities in the US and about three years of data on average per shop. This gives me 9 million invoices from 2013 to 2018. And in the data, I see a few things. So one is I have this text data that is what the auto repair mechanic typed in saying the time of repair that they performed on the car. Um, this was quite messy, full of lots of shorthands and typos. Um, I see the price that the consumer paid for their repair. And then I have some details about the type of car. So I see the make, the model, the year, and mileage. In the survey data, I have 160,000 ratings from 2016 to 2018. And what's really unique here is I can actually link the surveys to a specific invoice. So what I mean by that is if I know that Joe went to Bob's auto shop on Monday and got a brake pad replacement and then subsequently filled out the survey on Thursday, I can link these two, as can the auto repair shops in the data. So I'm going to use this as part of the analysis later on. So for the Yelp data, um, I looked for uh, Yelp for all the shops that I have in my data set. But then I also looked at the first five pages of listings for cities in which I have data. So I understand sort of the competitive landscape that my auto repair shops are in. I have the date, the rating, the text, the reviewer name and the reviewer zip. And this gives me 16,000 shops and 450,000 ratings. So what do these ratings look like on Yelp? So the modal rating is five, um, which is very common across most industries. We see this over and over again with the second most common rating being a one. And then two, three, and four stars are not left very frequently. So I'm sure you're all familiar with what Yelp looks like, but just a reminder, um, here's a screenshot of auto repair on Yelp. So we see that the shops are rated with these discrete ratings. So they're rounded to the nearest half star. For example, four and a half stars or four stars. So I'm gonna use this in the analysis later on. So the idea is that these auto repair shops have a mean underlying rating. And then at certain rounding thresholds, they're rounded up or down. So for example, from 4.25 to 4.75, the uh, rating that a consumer sees that's displayed is four and a half stars. But if it's below 4.25, then the rating will be rounded down to four stars. So I reconstruct this underlying average rating because I have all the individual ratings, but what the consumer sees is these discrete star rating buckets. So any questions on sort of just the setting before, before I continue? Not too much yet. I just have a quick question. I think I might've missed this. Um, what is the incentive for the repair shops to give the invoices to the platform? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I didn't explain uh, the details of the platform, but uh, the idea of the platform is that um, they verify auto repair shops as being of a certain quality. And so to verify they're of a certain quality, they wanna see the invoices. And so the idea is a shop joins this website to sort of signal their quality levels. Um, so that's also why I supplement with Yelp data because um, this already being on the website is already like a signal of quality. So it makes for a slightly different auto repair shops than, than the average shop. Um, I have a question about fake reviews. Um, so, you know, in Yelp, I can't really account for the fake reviews, but uh, on the platform, the reviews are solicited from verified customers. And so I think it's very unlikely that at least that data set has fake reviews. So I can compare Yelp to that and you know, see that they're fairly correlated, but um, I don't control for the fake reviews in the Yelp data. So now I wanna walk you through some descriptives that show that firms are sort of paying attention and changing their behavior um, due to the way that ratings are displayed. 
So first, in the course of this research, I spoke to a lot of auto repair shop managers. I just wanted to understand how they ran their business. Um, so I asked them, do you pay attention to your reviews? <laughs> and they said, first of all, I respond to all reviews, good or bad. I also have a service that tracks for reviews. So they're actually getting notifications and updates when they get new reviews and when their reviews change. And another one said, you live and die by what folks say about you out there these days. So they're paying a lot of attention. Um, another one told me, you know, I follow my Yelp reviews and not so much my Google reviews. So, you know, they're, they're clearly active in, in following these. So before I show you um, some of the evidence, I wanna walk you through sort of the story that I think that these auto repair shop managers kind of have in mind. So consider an auto repair shop that has an average rating of 4.2. This is gonna be displayed as four stars of the customer, but it's just below that 4.25 cutoff to be rounded up and displayed as four and a half stars. And say they only have five ratings, so one more five-star rating will push them past that threshold. So the firm is then gonna to have to decide whether to take some sort of costly action to improve their rating and therefore improve their long run revenue um, or not. But by taking on this action, because it's costly, they're gonna to have to give up some revenue this period. So the idea is I'm gonna be considering strategies that a firm only takes on occasionally due to the way ratings are displayed. Because it's costly, they only wanna take it on when it really matters, when their ratings might change. It's not really gonna be some sort of inherent quality boost that I'm considering. So I'm gonna consider two types of strategies. So the first strategy is that auto repair shops might actually refer away certain customers or repairs that have historically led to weak ratings for them in the past. And the second is what I call the extra effort strategy. So they might sort of give the consumer a coupon, order them coffee, spend more time walking through the repair with them, just something to sort of make the consumer happier. And this is a purely hypothetical picture, but the idea is that um, the shop knows their underlying average rating. And the closer they get to these rounding thresholds, the more likely they are to take on these strategies. And when they get far away from these rounding thresholds, they're sort of in a safer rating state. So they're gonna back off and not take on these strategies as often. So when I listen to you here, uh, so, so earlier you seem to imply uh, that this is a bad thing. Um, uh, now, now you have these two things that, um, are these, these th two things you will focus on, right? Uh, so when you go back one slide, um, I would think of one of them as a good thing and the other one of a bad thing in some sense, right? Um, and, and you seem to um, look at them uh, symmetrically. Could you say a little something about that? Yeah, yeah, so it's true. So I think that um, it, it's kind of good and bad. So it kind of depends on which customer you are. So for example, in the extra effort strategy, you are, it's better off for you if you get this extra effort but then perhaps if the shop is you know, doing extra effort a lot and then they pass this threshold and they stop doing it, the next customer might come in expecting this extra effort, but they get sort of a lower quality than they would expect. Um, so it, you know, it's kind of on average, it could be bad or good, but it kind of depends really on the actual individual. Um, so you're right. And then I guess I phrase the beginning of kind of, you know, these are bad, but it depends on sort of which individual you are. Even the referring away, it could be that, you know, maybe it's good you got referred away because maybe you came for a repair that they weren't that great at. Um, or it could just be a pain that you, you needed to get this repair done. They would have been perfectly fine, but they were just too scared to, to take you on. Um, so I think sort of it's, it's at a consumer level kind of where you fall um, in, in this process. I think it also depends on what the counterfactual is really, right? Uh, so you seem to imply that it's kind of bad that they don't take any... Uh, other action uh, that is more structural, uh, that improves quality, but um, whether or not uh, that is something they would want to do uh, depends on the situation they face, right? Uh, so if you think of a counterfactual where the rating system is different and you seem to look at um, you know, uh, no, uh, no aggregation uh, in, into these uh, kind of, uh, with these thresholds, um, uh, it depends on what, what is then ideal for them, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. And I mean, I'd, I'd love to sort of, I wish I had data to also look at sort of permanent quality investments, like actual more quality ship shifts rather than these kind of smaller strategies that they take on or off. Um, and I think that would be sort of a great next paper. Um, I don't sort of have data on that, but, but you're right. It is true. It kind of depends on perhaps it's better for these shops to just actually invest in their infrastructure or something bigger. Um, but right now I'm just kind of looking at these, these small changes they do um, around these rounding thresholds because Part of the idea is that I wanted to look at something that they could really easily change um, quickly and kind of institute just like, oh, you know, the rating just happened to drop. And so I want to do something really fast. Um, so that's kind of 
So, so there is a third type of strategy that's been discussed in the customer satisfaction literature, and that's basically the seller pressuring um, the customer to put in a good rating, right? So mm-hmm. like, hey, dude, like I got five kids. Here's the picture. Like, uh, you know, you there, I'm right on the cusp. You know, if you just I would appreciate it so much. Um, and so that seems like the type of effort I actually think that one and two are sort of productive efforts, more or less. But the third one where the, you know, the, the interaction doesn't change at all, but it's more about the pressure that the seller puts on. And then related to that, so this platform you're working with, they, so you can have sort of, like if you think about repeat business, right? So they put in the rating, but the repair shop knows who put in the rating or like how anonymous are these ratings? Yeah, um, I actually don't know exactly how anonymous. I know, I mean, they strip the the names, but they do see sort of what repair was given which rating. So, you know, they could probably back it out. Um, so I guess there, there could be some retaliation or whatnot, as you mentioned. Um, the, the surveys or the ratings don't come in for that one. They don't come in like daily, like the platform kind of surveys like every month or so, and then aggregates at that level. So it's not quite as um, you know, they don't know the next day that, that someone left them a battery necessarily, but right. because Shimon can come after you, he knows where you live, <laughs> like, you know, he's got your address. That's, I mean, that's another type of pressure as well. Yeah, that's true. Um, and as far as the sort of encouraging the consumer to leave, um, to leave a rating at all, you know, like putting that pressure, um, that is something that I'm sort of grouping under the extra effort. I'm kind of being a bit, um, abstract about what the extra effort is. And I'm actually going to show you some evidence that a lot of it is just that more reviews are left around these thresholds. And so part of that sort of extra effort could just be encouraging consumers to, to leave a review. Perhaps the, the coupon I mentioned could be kind of conditional on leaving a review. And so, you know, you might kind of see that, as you said, it, you know, one is productive in terms of sort of being nicer to the customer and the other is maybe not as productive in terms of the pressure. But for the sake of this, since I can't unfortunately disentangle that, I'm, I'm looping them both under the same category. Um, but it would be nice to kind of be able to, to disentangle those two. But for now, I'm going to count that as one of the potential um, extra effort strategies. So you might be wondering, you know, is this actually happening in practice, this first strategy? Are auto repair mechanics actually willing to sort of give up revenue right now for the hope of a long run revenue increase? Um, and there's been evidence that this happens in other settings. So in this news article by The Telegraph, they say one in three heart surgeons refuse difficult operations to avoid poor mortality ratings. Now I know that auto repair is not nearly as dire as, um, as heart surgery, um, but it is evidence that this has happened in other settings um, and is a potential, uh, potential strategy. So again, I spoke to the auto repair shop managers, um, didn't directly ask them this, but tried to hint around it. Um, and one said, sometimes it's that we can't deliver in reality what the client's expectation is, could be price centric, time centric, et cetera. And another said, when we turn away jobs, it's not usually due to workflow, but more often in how our interactions with the customer. We can tell from the start if it's gonna be a bad match with us and there's no point in taking on the job from the beginning. So, you know, they don't just turn people away because they don't have the time, but rather because they think, you know, it's just not gonna be a good fit. And potentially that not good fit could be that they're worried about a bad review. So the way I check if this is happening in the data is I use that fact that I can match the invoice to the rating. Um, So this will allow me to classify repairs as being risky or not. So I can classify repairs as being risky depending on the repair type. So using that text um, data I have on what repair is performed, as well as the type of car, which I view as sort of a proxy for the type of customer. And then I'm gonna define a risky repair as anything that's not a five-star rating. Um, Since five is the modal rating, it's pretty bad if you don't get five stars. And this will allow me to quantify the amount of risky repairs that any shop takes on at each point. And so this riskiness measure is going to be shop dependent. So it's going to be for your shop, is this repair or this car type risky? Are these these risky repairs uh, identified at the shop level or overall? Yeah, they're defined at the shop level. So a risky one repair could be risky for shop A, but not for shop B. So it's, it's within shop. Um, as well as over time. So I'll look at the following regression where the outcome is whether or not the rating was five stars. And then I have fixed effects for the top 200 repairs I see or the car model, and then shop and month date fixed effects. And this will give me the percentage of invoices that month that a shop performs that contains a risky repair. 
So then I look at how this um, share of risky repairs uh, varies depending on a shop's current rating state. So I look at what's the shop's underlying average rating and how close they are to the nearest rounding threshold. And so what I find is that the further away a rating moves from one of these rounding thresholds, the greater the share of risky repairs it takes on. So it's going back to that picture that I showed before of sort of when they're close to these rounding thresholds, they take on more of the strategy by turning away more people. And the further away they move from these rounding thresholds, the less likely they are to turn away consumers. Kind of flipping that and looking at it in a slightly different way, I look at after receiving a less than five-star rating, how many of that repair type do you perform in the future? And I find that the fewer of that repair type you perform after you get a five-star rating. So any questions about this, this first strategy? Megan, can I quickly clarify this? Um, if I understand correctly, you define a risky repair as something about the variance of, of, the star, of the rating I get. And a high variance can mean, can mean uh, a risk in a sense with different potential outcome but it also means something about quality of how I decide to give the repair. Maybe it's something I can choose. Is it, do I do a good job or not? Is it something we should be thinking about or it's, so why, why is it one versus another? Yeah, so that's a good point. It could be that, you know, the, the mechanic sort of has more uh, discrepancy in terms of the type of repair. So I'm just, um, I'm just trying to simplify it and just say like, did you get a five-star rating or not? not? I'm not thinking about sort of the mechanic's choice in which repair is being performed. It just purely like in the past when you did this repair, did you get a five-star rating or not? I, see. Um, I mean, to quickly, maybe as a quick follow-up on this, one thing you could do about if, it, and I'm not sure if it's a concern or not, uh, like it depends what, what others repairs, but if there was particular types of repairs where mechanic has more control over the outcome and can, if there's something we expect from what we know about mechanics, that it's more about the action versus the type that's something you could, you could check. Yeah, yeah, no, that's definitely a good point. It's something I thought about, but I haven't really dived into because I'm not entirely sure how to, how to figure that out. But it could be, you know, something like when someone comes in for an oil change, that's kind of a clear thing that they asked for, right? Versus if they come in for, I don't know, an engine overhaul or something, maybe, you know, the, the mechanic can do something less intense. And so they have more uh, decision on that. And that's um, something that's, that's one of the sort of the next steps I have on, on my model to try and uh, disentangle those two and right now I've, I've simplified it but I definitely think that's that's an important thing that that I, I definitely want to address next. Uh, Megan do you incorporate all re all uh, repairs or all invoices or just ones that are rated because you can imagine the non-rating is also reflective of something. Yeah that's true so I incorporate um, to define if it's risky I just incorporate things that are rated so the the invoices that are rated are definitely are a subset based on which um, invoices that the repair that the third party sent out surveys to. So uh, they don't send surveys to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. So there's some that won't get a rating. Um, but you're right in that there are then also some people they sent surveys to that don't respond. Um, and so I haven't I haven't incorporated that. Um, that could be another measure, I guess. Of yeah, do you do you even respond to the the rating? As you know, it's you know been shown that you know people. As you see in, in the just summary statistics I presented, if people have extreme reactions, they're more likely to rate, right? So, um, there, there are a couple of questions in the audience. I think they both relate to um, the number of ratings and how the role that that plays separately from the uh, rounding. And then there's a related question about whether the weight of the ratings in the average changes. Uh, based on the age of the rating. So in some platforms, older ratings get removed and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. So for the first question about the number of reviews, um, so I do, you know, I run several uh, uh, regressions looking at how demand, um, how demand changes based on the ratings. And I also try including the number of reviews. And I do find, as has been seen before, that sort of the, the more reviews also matter, right? So a consumer, you know, if there's only five reviews and five stars, they don't like it as much as there's 50 reviews and five stars. And so I do see that pattern in this data. Um, I haven't incorporated that in this, um, but it's, it's again on my to-do list. And I think um, something that, that shows up um, as far as the, sorry, remind me of the second question again. Uh, do, do, are all reviews weighted equally or are some, are the older ones downweighted or removed? Yeah, so um, on this third-party platform, all reviews are weighted equally. Um, I believe on Yelp, 
they are. I know that Yelp sometimes takes ratings away and not. And so I'm just using like a, a shot of, of what I have at that current time. Um, but I'll show you at the end when I go through counterfactuals, I look at a counterfactual of how things would change if ratings, more recent ratings are weighted heavily. Um, Cause I definitely think that's sort of an interesting way that the ratings platforms can, can change their uh, displayed. So I'll take a look at that next or later. Um, so just a follow-up question while we're still on questions. So the question was about how hard or easy it is to change an average when there are lots of reviews versus few reviews and whether you take that into account. Yeah, yeah. So definitely it's clearly harder to change when there's a lot of reviews. Um, so in my model, I'm just going to focus on shops that have up to 125 ratings. After that, it's pretty hard to change. And I also don't see that many shops that have more ratings. So um, a lot of this, these results will kind of point to the first maybe like two years that a shop is on a ratings platform. And after that, they kind of study out. Um, but it really depends on the rate at which they get ratings. But but yeah, this is more focused on the, the earlier stages. But that's part of why the counterfactuals are interesting, right? If, if you wait more recent reviews, there could be ways to sort of encourage um, like even older shops to, to keep up with these strategies or not. <laughs> um, so I'll move on to the, the second strategy, which is the, the extra effort strategy. Um, so just going back to this picture, um, you know, we see these uh, rounding cutoffs at which point the shops are rated uh, rounded up or down. And I'm gonna be focusing on the data that's within a certain bandwidth around these rounding thresholds, um, cause that's sort of where a lot of the action is going on. So um, first over, overall 1.3% of new customers leave reviews. And if I look at a certain bandwidth, um, which I select by doing cross validation, um, but this is robust to a variety of bandwidths, I see that there are more reviews being left within a bandwidth around these rounding thresholds. Um, so, you know, what Dina mentioned earlier, part of it is that they're just encouraging consumers to leave more reviews uh, when their reviews are likely to change. So there's a 25% increase in reviews being left. And this is a little stronger when a ra uh, average rating is just below those rounding thresholds. And this effect is the strongest at the 4.75 threshold, which is the rounding cutoff to be displayed as five stars. Um, so here we actually see a 50% increase in reviews being left and 22% increase um, below the threshold compared to above. And second, these reviews are also more likely to be stronger, they're better reviews, right? So within a bandwidth, the average rating is 4.2 compared to outside the bandwidth is 3.7. So this summary, in summary, it says, when a shop's average rating is close to a displayed rating rounding threshold, more reviews are left and the average rating is higher. So shops are somehow changing their behavior to encourage good reviews and encourage more of them. And then my third piece of evidence, which is similar to more reviews being left, is that there's an excess mass of ratings just above these rounding thresholds. So here I have a histogram where on the x-axis is a shop's average rating normalized to their closest rounding threshold. So at zero, it means they're right on a rounding threshold. And um, this is just the distribution. And we see that there's this big peak to the right of a rounding threshold and a trough below. Now ratings are left um, in discrete numbers. You can only leave one, two, three, and four star. So we would expect to see somewhat of this in practice. So when I simulate what ratings would look like if the ratings were independent, um, that's this dark pink color. And I do see that there is a dip and a peak. But in practice, we see about a third more mass above the rounding threshold and a third less mass below. So this is just more evidence that some the shops are changing their behavior around these thresholds. So now that we see this evidence, um, the idea that I'm thinking of, as I mentioned, is that it's some temporary boost in quality. It's not a permanent quality shift. And it's going to be an action that's costly. It could actually be monetarily costly to the firm, or it could just be costly in terms of time or even mental bandwidth. But it's an action that I don't observe as a researcher, and so I need a model to back out when it's happening. So I guess we just answered a bunch of questions, but um, feel free I to had one. I don't know if I missed something, but uh, I, I thought you were saying there's one of the strategies to, is to turn away customers when you expect maybe a bad match. But at mm -hmm. the same time, you see in, the, in these uh, reduced form evidence that uh, people leave more reviews, that they're encouraged to leave more reviews. Mm -hmm. yeah. Aren't those like going against each other? Like uh, how can you encourage more reviews, but at the same time turn away customers? It seems like there's more evidence for strategy two than strategy one, I guess. Yeah. I so, head, but I might've missed something. Yeah, no, no, it's a good point. So it's that 
for the repairs that you don't turn away, the repairs you do have, more of them are leaving reviews. So the fraction of people leaving reviews who you do have repairs for is, is increasing. So it's as a fraction, not total. I, I, yeah, it's a fraction. I see. Uh, just a, another another quick question. Um, is the speed of at which reviews arrive a function of how many reviews there already are? So you focused on it being close to the cutoff or not, but you might think that the incentives are to accumulate, to get as many reviews as quickly as possible. Once you're up to 100, you don't need the reviews to come in as quickly. So is, is that in the data? Um, yeah, that's true. I actually haven't taken a look at that. I mean, the, the rate at which you're getting repairs is increasing with your star rating. Um, but I haven't looked at it as far as with the number of reviews. So I should take a look at that. Yeah. Um, so as an, I'm now going to walk through the supply side model, but as an input to the supply side model, I need to understand and quantify how consumers are responding to reviews in this particular setting. Um, so I'm going to borrow a strategy from Luca 2016, which uh, helps disentangle the effects of quality and ratings on demand, right? Because we need to determine is it quality or is it ratings that's uh, driving demand? And so I'll use a regression discontinuity around these rounding thresholds to measure the causal effect of being a half star higher rating just above the threshold compared to just below. And I find that there's an over $16,000 increase in consumer lifetime revenue from each half star increase in rating, which represents about a 13% increase in revenue. So this is fairly substantial for I'm sure you're paying attention. And I'm gonna use this as an input uh, to the next model. Question. Can I ask you a question? Isn't manipulation a problem in this setting? Yeah, in terms of like Yelp reviews being manipulated or just that. The, uh, yeah, you yeah, just um, showed us that there was manipulation, right? So then. Yeah. Yeah. So I get this question a lot. So, um, so with the regression discontinuity, because um, a shop can't perfectly manipulate. Um, and so there's a paper by Lee and Lemu 2010 that says if, as long as it's not perfectly manipulable, the regression discontinuity still holds because there's gonna be shops on either side of the threshold who are trying to manipulate and um, trying to move, but they can't perfectly decide which side they're on. Um, so, you know, you do need to take these results with a grain of salt, um, but at the same time, like there, it should, you should, you can still use this in that they can't perfectly manipulate, manipulate their ratings. Sorry, can I just ask a clarifying question? I think it's just something I missed. So you have reviews from Yelp and from these private feedback? Yeah. And, and so you have, so when you're doing this, this is from Yelp? This one's from Yelp, yeah. The results look very similar on um, the other reviews. Um, they're just not as strong. Um, so I use Yelp just because I think more people are using Yelp. This third party isn't as commonly used, but they're- So what do you, what do you think happens with raters? So they, they go to the shop, they fill out the survey, and then they also put a um, review on Yelp? So they're putting the, their um, feedback twice, you think? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I sort of don't make any assumptions about that. It could be different people, it could be the same people. Um, I see that the, you know, the ratings are highly correlated across the two, but uh, for the most part, I'm, I'm using the, the Yelp for the demand side and then the other ratings for the supply side, because that's what the sort of supply firm is seeing um, in terms of matching the ratings and the invoice. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure about sort of who's... But the who's survey doing. ratings are never released or they're also publicly released? The, the last question on the survey is publicly released. So the last question is just how would you rate this uh, from one to five? Yeah. No, I was just asking this because you actually have, maybe there's something interesting you can do because you have two platforms with ratings. It's just not exactly, you know, lots of strategies to use that. Uh, yeah. But I just wasn't, it wasn't clear to me exactly like what's going on? Because again, it's just hard to imagine people would put ratings twice, but maybe they do. So I don't know. Yeah. 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 No. I mean, I think for the most part, it's probably different people. Um, you know, unfortunately, I wish I could see you know who's going to Yelp and then who's going to the auto repair shop, so I can do something with the two platforms um, and compare that. But I don't. I don't know sort of who viewed Yelp and then. Chose. But you're seeing that they're moving in tandem, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Megan, can I quickly clarify on, the, on David's previous point that uh, if I do it correctly, uh, the design here is different for what, your analysis of suppliers versus consumers. For suppliers, you lose just as they around the threshold. And here you look at if they cross this threshold and it increased, what is the effect? So yeah. I wonder, uh, do these concerns about supply sites still apply in this case? If it's just, if you're in the area, 
Uh, and did you check if firms react separately if they're just below or just above in how they try to manipulate? Because if they do behave differently, then, we're, then we need to interpret very carefully. Yeah, um, yeah, so I think, so in terms of if they react differently above and below, so they do seem to be, uh, if there's below, there's like a slight increase in getting more consumers to leave reviews. So there's like, it's a little different, but there's still, I still see the behavior on both sides, um, but you're right in that, you know, if there's sort of a big discrepancy on either side, then that is an issue. Um, and yes, it's also that consumers, consumers just see these sort of discrete jumps versus the shop is looking at like bandwidths around these thresholds. So they're kind of looking at the underlying average. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but. Um, no, 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 no. Yeah, it did. And it sounds like if that's the case, then I wonder, I was still worried about uh, this kind of, it, why can't we still interpret the discontinuities then? Because it seems like you're, you're saying that behavior of suppliers is similar on both sides of the threshold. And then if the threshold is crossed, it's still some treatment effect. It's like, we need to be careful to interpret what this effect is, but it's, it should be like an interpretable effect. Or yeah. like maybe I'm not maybe I'm not following. Yeah, no, I think it is. Um, so I I I'm moving along with assuming that that we can use that. Um, and you know, this isn't like my takeaway result, just sort of something to to put in in the supply side model. So yeah, we can chat more if, if that didn't get at your question. Um, but so what is what is the the model I'm thinking about look like? So consider a focal auto repair shop. So they have a displayed rating, they have an underlying average rating and a certain number of ratings. And then a repair will arrive at the shop um, with Poisson distribution Lambda star, where star is that displayed rating the consumer sees. And the more, the higher your displayed rating, the more repairs arrive at your shop. And then upon receiving a repair, a shop will then have to decide which effort level and they will get profit pi. If they exert extra effort, then they're gonna subtract that pi from kappa, which is the cost of that effort. And then a review will be left with probability PR or not, and their rating will be updated. The consumer sees this display rating and they choose which auto repair shop to go to. They will then observe which effort level they receive upon getting the repair. And then they will have to decide whether to leave a review and which star rating to leave. So the goal of the model is to calculate optimal policy functions of when firms should be taking on this extra effort strategy to estimate the cost of the effort and then to construct counterfactuals to see how effort would change if ratings were displayed differently. So just what does this look like um, again? Um, so the action space is that the shop decides normal or extra effort with cost kappa. I'm gonna look at uh, discrete time periods at the weekly level. And then the shop has an average rating from zero to five and a certain number of ratings, which I uh, mentioned before, but I'm cutting off at 125 just because I don't see that in the data as often and for ease of estimation. So PR is the probability that a consumer leaves a rating after a repair. And the ratings are gonna be got, drawn from two different distributions depending on whether extra effort is exerted. So um, if extra effort is exerted, it'll be drawn from a distribution with more likely that you get a five-star rating. So in practice, you know, I hardly ever see reviews that are two, three, and four stars. So it's really hard for me to disentangle the effect of effort on two, three, and four star ratings. So I'm just gonna focus on how extra effort changes the probability of getting a one-star rating versus five-star rating, which I'll call delta. And so these are the two distributions for which ratings are drawn depending on if extra effort is exerted. So um, just to summarize again, so uh, the repairs will arrive with Poisson distribution and then based on the number of repairs, you get a certain number of reviews um, where these are drawn from the different ratings distributions. And then the shop gets profit, which is the number of repairs they receive times pi minus the cost of that effort. So the firm will have to decide whether or not to take on extra effort based on their Bellman equation, where they'll take on extra effort if the bottom equation is bigger than the top equation, where the differences are just the new ratings being drawn depending on the effort level and the uh, profit they get. So any questions on the model? So I think Sorry. from the firm's perspective, right, um, whether or not I uh, spend uh, resources on making people happier and that costs me something, or I spend resources um, on uh, encouraging them uh, to rate is more or less the same thing, right? Uh, but later, and, and you take a stance here, I suppose um, that it's uh, the first, right? Uh, I spend uh, resources um, to make people happier. 
Um, but um, when I later think about counterfactuals, uh, that's not innocuous, I suppose. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So right now I'm saying, uh, I'm just considering that the extra effort's changing the probability of the review being left. Sorry, the probability, which rating is being left, not the probability of review being left, which is exactly. part of the next um, thing I want to do is incorporate both of them. Um, so this is just sort of the, the simpler, the first run like stage of the model of do you change the actual rating being left, not the rate at which the rating is left? Yes. Yep. Thank you. But yeah, that'll definitely play out in the counterfactuals. So are we assuming that prices are not changing below and above the threshold? Yeah. So right now everything else is being held fixed. Price is being held fixed. Um, so okay. yeah. Um, so the three parameters that I'm structurally estimating are the probability of obtaining one star with no effort, the change in probability of obtaining one star with the extra effort, and then the cost of that effort. And I find the probability of one star with no effort is 38%, the change is 31%, and the cost is 11%. So this means 11% of their total profit is the cost of that action. So that, you know, it's not huge, but it's definitely significant enough for them to sort of question, should we be taking on this action? And so then using this model, we can consider sort of how firms should be responding. Um, so if they never take on this strategy, consider a firm that has an average rating of 4.75. So they're right at that rounding threshold to be displayed as five stars. They only have five reviews. So by never taking on an extra effort, they could lose 25% of their future firm, future firm value. Now with only five reviews, of course, any one review has a huge impact. Um, but even when they have 50 reviews and the next subsequent review doesn't matter as much, they can still lose 1% of their firm value. So sort of looking at this graphically, on the x-axis, we have the number of reviews that a shop has, and the y-axis is the percentage of states in which they should exert extra effort. So from zero to about 25 reviews, they should always exert extra effort. And then the more reviews they have, the less likely, the less often that they need to exert extra effort. So this is fairly intuitive. Um, if we sort of flip this graph, on the x-axis, there's now the rating state, and the y-axis is just going to be zero or one on whether they should exert extra effort. And then we can look at different lines for how many reviews a shop has. So with one review, a shop should exert extra effort no matter what their current rating. But the more reviews they get, there could be times at which they don't exert extra effort. So here at 26 reviews, the shop does not need to exert extra effort at 4.5. 4.5 is safely between 4.25 and 4.75. It's as far away from a rounding threshold as you can be. So now there's no need to take on this extra effort strategy. And sort of the numbers here are a little funky depend because of the way I sort of set up um, based on the fact that I have more data in the later rating states. But the idea is sort of the more reviews you add, the bigger these ranges get at which they don't have to exert extra effort. And they kind of bounce around depending on those rounding thresholds. So then I can use this to consider some counterfactuals. So the first counterfactual is what if rounding, what if ratings aren't rounded? What if a consumer sees the average rating to two decimal places? And then I'll assume a linear interpolation of repair arrival with average rating. And intuitively, I find that firms uh, incentive to exert extra effort increases. So effort is observed about 30% more often. So this is because now there's sort of fewer safe states. So for example, um, before when ratings were rounded, if a shop had an average rating of 4.8, they don't really care if they get up to 4.85 but now they're gonna care and they're gonna try and, and increase their rating. If we flip it, looking at more discretization, now the firm's extra effort, incentive to exert extra effort decreases. Now there's sort of more space at which their roundings are less likely to matter. And so, you know, we talked in the beginning about how there's a lot more nuances to this, like some consumers might be better off, some might be worse off, but the fact that there's um, less effort with rounding ratings generally points to the fact that rounding ratings can be lowering potential uh, consumer welfare. And of course, Megan, this, this also assumes that uh, uh, rating recency, recency doesn't matter in the sense if I have two shops with four point star average and the last seven reviews of one shop are five stars and the other shop are one stars, the probability of booking one or the other at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So can I ask a question about the rounding? So I feel like we've known for a while that, you know, that there's this gaming going on, right? Like the Luca paper, I feel like they're, I mean, this shows it in a, in a very clean way, in, a, in a, a very detailed way. But so why, why do you think that platforms continue to do things like round ratings, right? Like 
this has been talked about for a while now. What, what is your sense of why that is? Yeah, so I think one thing that I'm not taking into account here is I'm purely just kind of thinking about like the firm and the consumer and I'm not thinking about like what the platform's incentives are. And I think the platform has a whole another series of incentives. Like it's easier cognitively for consumers to just like see star ratings. And so by having sort of a, something that's easier for consumers to, to read or interpret, they might get higher traffic. Um, or perhaps even that, you know, the firms are encouraging the platforms to do this so they don't have to worry as much about the detailed ratings. Um, so I think there's sort of a lot of sort of platform incentives that I'm abstracting away from. I'm just focusing on the firm and consumer, but I think that that's kind of why is that, you know, it just, it's easier for the consumer, easier to make comparisons. Um, and so I'm not taking that into account. I, I have a follow-up question on that. On that. Like uh, I, I have this lay theory that consumers might actually overweigh the ratings. Like um, if you see a 4.9 or 4.89, you might go for the 4.9, but that difference is completely irrelevant actually. And so that's another reason why you might want to round in some sense, the consumers are boundedly rational. And it, I, I, I didn't, I, I don't follow your model very closely in detail. So are you assuming some sort of rational expectations about uh, the like quality or something like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I not really. I'm just kind of assuming that I'm taking the um, the demand side effects I see with the regression discontinuity and just assuming that you know consumers are just following from that. Um, but that you know ratings and quality are probably correlated. But you know, as you mentioned, those little differences don't matter, which is exactly why I can do the regression discontinuity. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of taking this is what we see in terms of how these increase in ratings affect demand. Um, and I'm just using that as an input, but that is a good point that, you know, that perhaps maybe by rounding, this is actually encouraging consumers to not overweight the ratings as much, right? Maybe you can, maybe it's good to group these shops in terms of like four or four and a half star buckets so that they don't worry about like the little tiny details. So just wondering uh, your model, uh, could it ever uh, produce the opposite result uh, that removing rounding would be um, like uh, a bad thing? moving rounding would be. Yeah, so I mean, it kind of, it points to one of the questions you had earlier, which is that, you know, it, it kind of depends on which consumer you are, right? If you're that consumer getting extra effort, it, it could be- No, good. no, but even even without that, right? Uh, so so uh, what you now explain uh, sounds very reasonable, right? Um, so that, um, you know, when there's no rounding, then, uh, you know, they're uh, more often uh, in, the, in the sort of danger zone and they pay more attention, right? Uh, but wouldn't that imply that basically, um, your model is good for quantification, but um, you know, in order to have a qualitative statement, um, we can just do theory, right? Yeah. So yeah. So I mean, my main take around the slide is that you know, rounding ratings are lowering consumer welfare, but you know, it kind of, it, you know, that's just kind of what this sort of points to. Um, but you know, there is a lot more to take into account that perhaps a theory model could could take into account better. Um, so I've gotten some questions about weighting um, more recent reviews. So I've also looked at that counterfactual. Um, so Velody 2020 has a paper looking at, a theoretical paper looking at what happens if we uh, weight re more recent reviews more heavily. Um, so one of the reasons to do this would be to help lower barriers of entry, but also sort of more relevant in this context is sort of it discourages shops from resting on their laurels, right? They need to sort of continue to maintain their, um, their quality in order to keep getting good reviews. Um, so to do this, I weight this week's ratings of one over alpha, the previous week, one over alpha squared, et cetera. And I find that effort occurs up to 95% more time than in the original model. Um, so weighting more recent reviews can encourage shops to continue this sort of extra effort strategy, um, which, you know, you can decide if it's a, a good or a bad thing. Um, but I think this is definitely an interesting way that the platform, an interesting thing platforms could consider and perhaps how to change the, the rating strategy. And I sort of love to see this this happen and, and what happens in practice. Um, I just answered some, but interrupt me if there's any more. Um, so, you know, I mentioned I'm still working on a lot of extensions to this. So probably the most important one is that I provided a lot of descriptive evidence that the probability at which a rating is being left is changing. And right now the model is just looking at the change in actual ratings distributions. So I wanna add that in as well. Um, and then also include which I see as demand side descriptive evidence that the number of ratings also influences the probability a shop receives a repair, not just the actual star rating. Um, so I can add that in as well. 
And then um, there's also been talk about different types of repairs, right? So it's likely that if a shop does uh, oil change versus replaces, you know, brakes or an engine or something, that the cost of that extra effort is going to be different, right? It's going to be a lot easier to sort of make a consumer happier with something simple. Um, and also the ratings are likely to be different. So I want to take into account sort of hard and easy repairs. And then there's also been some work looking at sort of the ratings, um, sort of how it moves over time. So consumers are more likely to leave a rating when their opinion differs from the previous rating or when they have extreme reviews, um, if they're going to leave one or five star. You know, if they see a lot of five star reviews, they don't care as much about leaving a rating because they're not making such of an impact. Uh, so I want to sort of take into account the transition of ratings and how that changes over time. Um, so I'm wrapping up a little early, but uh, so the contribution of this work is that I provided some descriptive evidence that firms are paying attention to their average ratings and taking on actions to both increase their review incidence and the average rating being left. Uh, I presented two channels through which firms can improve their ratings and developed a model of how firms should strategically respond to ratings in different states. And this model allows us to look at different counterfactuals and analyze different ways of displaying ratings. And I think the implications of this are that the way that ratings are displayed has an impact on both firm actions and consumer welfare. And it really begs future questions about optimal platform design and incentive alignment. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm kind of not taking into account the, the platform's incentives and sort of what they're after. And so kind of adding in that third party would definitely be a, a great sort of future research direction. So thank you all. Stick around for, for more questions. Thanks, Megan. That was really interesting. Um, so anyone that wants to, at this point, come come become a panelist and, and join the conversation, feel free to raise your hand. Um,